Well, good morning. We have an extended reading today, but fear not, fear not. We will not have you sit from morning till midday like Ezra did in the book of Nehemiah. And it is our blessing to sit under this reading. Amen? Okay. Well, we're reading from uh, Deuteronomy 4, verses 9 to 31. Only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, unless they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children how on that day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb. The Lord said to me, gather the people to me that I may let them hear my words so that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on the earth and that they may teach their children so. And you came near and stood at the foot of the mountain while the mountain burned with fire to the heart of heaven, wrapped in darkness, cloud, and gloom. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but saw no form. There was only a voice. And he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform. That is, the Ten Commandments. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and rules, that you might do them in the land that you are going to over to possess. Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully, since you saw no form on that day, that day the Lord spoke to you at Horeb, or out of the midst of the fire, beware, lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourselves in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the water under the earth. And beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the hosts of heaven, you'd be drawn away and bowed down to them and serve them, things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. But the Lord has taken you and brought you out from the iron furnace, out of Egypt, to be a people of his own inheritance as you are this day. Furthermore, the Lord was angry with me because of you, and he swore that I should not cross the Jordan, that I should not enter the good land that the Lord your God has given you for an inheritance. For I must die in this land. I must not go over the Jordan, but you shall go over and take possession of that good land. Take care, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make a carved image, the form of anything that the Lord your God has forbidden you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. When you father children and children's children and have grown old in the land, if you act corruptly and make, by making a carved image in the form of anything and by doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord your God, so as to provoke him to anger, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will soon utterly perish from the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. You will not live long in it, but will be utterly destroyed, and the Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. And there you, you will serve gods of wood and stone and the work of human hands that neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. But from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. When you are in tribulation, all these things come upon you in the later days. You will return to the Lord for your God and obey his voice. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. This is the word of the Lord. Would you pray with me? God, we give you thanks for the reading of the word this morning, Lord, and we are blessed by it. Now speak through your servant Trent, and may we eagerly hear and accept in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. For the commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you. Neither is it far off, it is in your mouth and in your heart. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, then you shall live. Therefore choose life, for he is your life and length of days that you may dwell in the land so that you and your offspring may live. 
Well, there are some things that just should never be done. And in 1972, the singer and songwriter Jim Croce gave us a clue about what some of those things are. You don't tug on Superman's cape. You don't spit into the wind. You don't take the mask off that old Lone Ranger. And you don't mess around with Jim. Or if you listen to the rest of the song, Slim. That's right. There are just some things you should not do. And we might add to that great list he compiled one more thing. You don't cheat on a jealous God. You don't cheat on a jealous God. It's strange to us to think about God in that sense, as though we might cheat on him. But in fact, the Bible speaks about this numerous places. If you read the book of Hosea, nearly the whole book is devoted to this theme of God's people cheating on him. Much of, uh, or large sections of Ezekiel, Jeremiah, the other prophets are dealing with this issue of God's people cheating on him. You see, God not only speaks of his people as being his servants, as being his children, as being his treasured possession, but God also speaks of us as being his bride. And as his bride, we have the capacity to be faithful to him, loyal to him, lovingly devoted to him, and we also have the capacity to go after other lovers. And the primary way in which God's people do that is what's called idolatry. That is, giving our love, our devotion, putting our hope and our trust in something other than God. In this chapter, chapter 4, Moses is preparing the people and us for the law that he's going to start giving once we get into chapter 5. And we saw last week, he, he talked about the extraordinary blessing of God's word to God's people. And the way in which, if, if we live by that word, the nations will see the wisdom of our God. There is a missional purpose in God giving his people the word. But there's something in particular that can stand in the way of the people of God accomplishing the mission of God by living by the word of God. And that thing that can get in the way is idolatry. And so in this passage, Moses is condemning in strong terms what he's going to condemn on and on as we go on through the book, and that is this idea of cheating on a jealous God. Now, the thing about idolatry is that we can run headlong into it, and we can also sort of slip into it subtly, almost even unnoticed to where we don't even realize we're doing it. The fact that this passage says over and over repeatedly, take care, watch out, be careful, that tells us something about ourselves, doesn't it? It tells us that we are not naturally inclined to be on guard against slipping into idolatry. That before we even know it, our love and devotion, which is meant only for God himself, might turn into, well, love for something other than him that belongs only to him. And so in this passage, he tells us multiple times, take care not to forget which, by the way, is another way of saying, remember. But we're going to just change things up because I've been saying remember over and over and I'm going to keep saying it. So we're going to go ahead with this theme of take care not to forget. And in particular, he lays out three things for us in this passage. First of all, take care not to forget that our God is a speaking God. Take care not to forget that our God is a speaking God. If you look with me in verse 9, it says there, Only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. Take care that you don't forget what your eyes have seen, because if you forget what your eyes have seen, then the meaning and significance of those things is also going to depart from your heart. That would be an extraordinarily problematic thing. Now, we understand the importance of taking care to remember certain things and, and not forgetting certain things and passing those things on to our children and our children's children. For example, in our own country, we 
observe certain days in the year that help us to remember. On Veterans Day, we pause and we remember the significance of those people who have served in our armed forces. On Memorial Day, we pause and we take care not to forget the cost of our freedom and the privileges that we have as Americans. Well, the same is true in the church. Every Sunday, we set apart this day to take care that we don't forget who God is and what he has done for us. We have particular seasons in the year around the time of Christmas and Easter when we pause and we take care not to forget the significance of God's mighty works. Now, in this passage, Moses is certainly thinking about the fact that we need to take care not to forget the exodus and the mighty works that God did to deliver his people. But he has something else in mind particularly that we need to take care not to forget. And we see it in verse 10. How on the day that you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, which is Deuteronomy's word for Mount Sinai, I remember, the Lord said to me, gather the people to me that I may let them hear my words so that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on the earth and that they may teach their children so. And you came near and stood at the foot of the mountain while the mountain burned with fire to the heart of heaven, wrapped in darkness, cloud, and gloom. He says, don't forget what you saw the day the Lord told me to assemble you all at the foot of the mountain. And you saw the mountain flaming with fire. And that flaming flame of fire was also enveloped in a dark cloud and gloom. This is an extraordinary display here that they're seeing. And that the, the, the fire itself is a picture, of course, of God's illumination and the way he brings light and, and life, but it's also a picture of his holiness and essentially the, the danger of getting too near to one so holy. And at the same time, we see in this passage that the fire is wrapped in a cloud, suggesting the mystery of God and the fact that he has to protect us even from seeing him in the full blazingness of his glory. It's an extraordinary scene. And then he continues in verse 12. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but saw no form. There was only a voice. So what's significant about what they saw is that what they saw wasn't the primary significance. But rather, it's what they heard out of what they saw. He says, you saw no form. There was only a voice. The way in which God has chosen to reveal himself to his people is not primarily by what he looks like, but by what he says. He is a God who speaks and who reveals himself through his word. And he expects us to be a people who listen. Verse 13, he declared to you his covenant which he commanded you to perform, that is, the Ten Commandments. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone. What is the purpose of this pyrotechnic display of God to show himself in the form of a, of a fire burning on a mountain wrapped in cloud, terrifying the people? The aim of this was to put the fear of God in them, so that they would desire to keep his commandments. Moses says in Exodus 20, 20, do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be for you, that you may not sin. Does it sound like a contradiction to you in that one sentence? Do not fear, for God is showing himself to you that you might fear. Oh, is Moses confused? No. On the one hand, he's saying, do not fear and do not just be in sheer terror at this God. But at the same time, he is revealing himself, to, a portion of himself to you so that you would have an appropriate awe and reverence of him. So that you who hear his voice would not take him lightly. He is not a God to be trifled with. He is certainly not a God to cheat on. And so this is why God reveals himself this way, that we might reverence him, 
Be in awe of him and listen to his voice and do what he says. Uh, Jeffrey Tigge, a Jewish scholar, says that reverence is man's response to God's power. It consists of both respect and awe at his grandeur and dread of his power, which serves as a deterrent to disobeying him. It is one of Moses' main aims in Deuteronomy to instill reverence for God as a guiding principle in the people's lives. My hope as we come through this book of Deuteronomy is that by the time we get to the end, we have a deeper awe and reverence at God, a more holy dread of him and of disobeying him, that we would take him more seriously than we ever have, that we would not treat him as a trifle and a God to be cheated on as we see fit, but that we would see him as the holy God who's revealed himself through his word and still speaks. You see, God didn't stop speaking at Mount Sinai, but he continued to speak to his people through the prophets, and he continued to speak to his people through the apostles. And the writer of Hebrews tells us that in these latter days, he continues to speak to us, and he has spoken to us through his son, who is called the Word. He is the embodiment of the God who speaks. He is the the living Word of God. He is God's word to us, meant to be revered, held in honor, obeyed, and even worshipped. He is the perfect representation and image. He is God, this Jesus, whom we gather to worship. So let us not, let's take care not to forget that our God is a God who speaks, and we ought to listen to his voice every time we open this book, every time you sit before a sermon, that that you've prepared your heart to say and, and, and take care not to forget who he is. And so that means we when we come to worship, we, you know, we don't want to make a practice of just rushing in here at the last second and, and, and sitting down and say, we're ready. This is God we're talking about. Well, we want to be prepared uh, reverently to listen to what he says and to reverently worship him. Secondly, take care not to forget that our God is a jealous God. Moses is going to talk about idolatry here in verses 15 to 29. 28, and as he does so, he's going to show us the temptation to idolatry, the foolishness of idolatry, and then the consequences of idolatry, which all should serve to help us to take care not to forget that our God is a jealous God. First, let's talk about the temptation to idolatry. He says in verse 15, therefore, watch yourselves very carefully, since you saw no form on the day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire, Beware, lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourselves. He says, take care. Remember, when that day, when God revealed himself to you, you didn't see a form. Not that God doesn't have a form, but you didn't see one. So make sure you don't slip into making representations of the God who did not show himself to you. That should not be where you focus your energies as God's covenant people, but you should focus your energies on listening and obeying his word. In the next verses, he goes on to describe the kinds of things that the people may be tempted to carve for themselves as representations of God, whether they be fish or birds or people or any other kind of thing. He says, don't do that. And then in verse 19, he warns against assigning divinity or assigning things like the sun and moon and stars as being representations of God and so thereby worshiping them or thinking that by somehow venerating or worshiping them, they're they're worshiping God. He warns us against all of these things. And what he actually does, it's easy to miss, but what he does here when he talks about the order of these things the making images in the likeness of male and female or any animal or bird. If you go back to Genesis 1 and you read the order of creation in Genesis 1 and then you read the order in which Moses lists these things, he lists them exactly opposite of Genesis 1. I think the subtle message that he's giving here is that when we worship idols and we engage in idolatry, we flip the order of creation upside down. And actually, we who were called to rule over all of creation under God 
end up becoming servants of the things which have been created. That's what happens in idolatry. We debase ourselves. We lower ourselves from what God created us to be, and yet somehow we are still tempted to do exactly that, to shirk our proper place as the crown jewel of God's creation and to take a lower form and begin to worship and serve created things rather than the creator of them all. Well, that's already foolish, but he actually goes further in helping us see the foolishness of idolatry. Continuing down into verse 20, he says, But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt, to be a people for his own inheritance as you are this day. Now, that comes right on the heels of verse 19 where he's warning them, don't start worshiping the sun and the moon and the stars. God has given those things to all people so that all people can enjoy them and benefit from them and what they provide, but don't worship them like the nations that don't know me. He says emphatically in the Hebrew here, but you, the Lord has taken you and he's rescued you out of the furnace of Egypt. You're his treasured possession. Why would you debase yourself and become like the nations who don't know me and worship created things when you have this privileged position? I've revealed myself to you and given you my word. And this is still true today, brothers and sisters. Why debase ourselves and worship created things when God has made himself known to us, not only at Mount Sinai through the word, but through his son, Jesus Christ, in the revelation of scriptures. It's foolish. Verse 23, take care lest you forget the covenant the Lord your God of the Lord your God which he made with you and make a carved image in the form of anything that the Lord your God has forbidden you. Take care. Watch out that you don't slip into this creating representations for me. Why? Because it's spiritual adultery. Because it's cheating on a Jealous God, he says it in verse 24, for the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Don't trifle with him. Don't take him lightly and try to represent him with something made out of stone or wood. He's a jealous God. Jealousy is something we typically think of as a bad thing, and it can be a bad thing. But when it's used in the Old Testament, and certainly when it's used in reference to God, this jealousy refers to a legitimate passion that God has when something threatens to interfere with his relationship with his covenant people. It's the appropriate response of a husband or a wife who has a third party enter into the relationship and threaten the integrity of it. That's the appropriate response is to be jealous for your love. And God says to his people through Moses, do not bring in something else into this relationship. Don't turn from me for the Lord your God is a jealous God, a consuming fire. And those who engage in spiritual Adultery through idolatry will experience him as a consuming fire. And by the way, God has not changed. He is still a jealous God. He is still a consuming fire. The writer of Hebrews tells us this. He says, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. That's who he is. So when we come to worship him, let us do so reverently and with awe. And let us certainly not slip into worshiping idols. Some people think that reverence has to be reflected in the clothes that you wear, suit, for example. Some people think that reverence has to be demonstrated in a look that you have on your face, typically one that might be dour. Some think that reverence means that you do a certain kind of music in a service. And all of those things may reflect reverence, and they may not. But the most significant way in which we demonstrate real reverence for God is not the clothes that we wear or the look on our face or the music that we're listening to. The clearest way that we demonstrate reverence in our heart for God is that we listen and obey his word. If you want to know, do I reverence God? Do we as a church reverence God? The question is, are we listening to what he says and doing it? 
If not, there are consequences for idolatry, for going astray after other gods. He goes on to describe the consequences of idolatry. In verses 25 to 27, he talks about the fact that if you cheat on him, this jealous God, you can expect that you're going to perish. You can expect that you're going to become fewer in number. You can expect that God is going to kick you out of his land because he's not having that business in his land. So he's going to kick you out of the land. He's going to scatter his people among the nations. And he's going to, as it says in verse 28, there you will serve gods of wood and stone, the work of human hands that neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. If you want to insist on debasing yourself and worshiping the creative, the created things rather than the creator, then God is going to give you over to worshiping created things, things that can't see, hear, or smell, lifeless things, things less than you that you were created to rule over, you're going to serve them. And you can rest assured from what Moses has shown us about the way that idolatry upturns the order of creation, that to do that is going to debase us. We're going to become an increasingly debased people when we shirk our call to be the representative image of God in the earth and instead begin to serve created things. Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 1. This is what we read there. He says, claiming to be wise, these idolaters he's referring to, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. That should sound familiar. Therefore, God gave them up to the lusts of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. The people insisted on worshiping the works of their hands, the things that they made, their own image of God that they've created after their own image. And it says God gave them up. He gave them over to it, and they became further debased in their idolatry. If you put anything in God's place, be it something good like work or sex or money. These are good things, but if you put them in God's place, they will ultimately ruin you and debase you and make you less than human. Paul goes on and describes even more what happens. He describes in verses 26 and 27 about how men and women exchanged natural relations and became consumed with lust for one another. He goes on further in verse 28 and following, it says, they didn't see fit to acknowledge God, so God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. Verse 29, they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They're gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. This is the fruit of idolatry in your heart, in our hearts collectively, in society. This is where idolatry leads. You notice that these sins are not just sins against God, but nearly every single one of them is a sin against another human being. That's what idolatry is. When we de demote God from being God and put something else in his place, we also begin to treat the image of God as something less than the image of God. That's the effect. You see, there's only one image of God in the world. There's only one creature, one created thing which serves to be the image of God in the world, and it's people. He makes it very clear in Genesis 1 and 2. He created man, male and female, in his own image and likeness. There's nothing else in creation that can represent God rightly but you. And when we carve things out of stone or wood or we ascribe divinity to something where we give our loyalty to, to something, be it even our family or work or whatever the idols in our lives may happen to be. 
we, well, we become like them. We become like our idols. We become like what we, what we worship. And God has said, uh, we are to be like what we worship. We're to be like him. Genesis 3 tells us that after man's rebellion against God, we all became broken images of him. We no longer reflect him perfectly like a mirror into the world as we were created to. Now we're all broken mirrors. And the effect of that is you can look at any person, no matter how bad they are, because they're made in the image of God, we can see traces of glory in them. We can find in the worst person how still in some way they image the God who made them. But at the same time, in the very best person we can find, we will, if we look closely enough, we will see that they are a broken reflection of God. But we were made to image him. We were made to reflect him. Uh, One commentator says, if we would look for something that in some way images God in a way that is accessible to our experience we'll have to deal with one another. If you want to find the image of God, you're going to have to learn something about people because that's the visible representation of God upon the earth. Jesus is the perfect image of God. He is God. And by the grace of God, those who put their trust in Jesus are actually being conformed to become like Jesus so that we increasingly should be coming like what God is like. But we're all very much a work in progress, even still as such, and recognizing that we are still a work in progress, we ought to love one another well, which is exactly what John says. Don't think that you can love God while hating people. You cannot do it. He doesn't say while hating Christians. He's talking about people generally. Don't think you can love God while hating people. You can't even see God, but you can see people. And if you can't manage to love people, you don't love God. Finally, take care not to forget. Not only is our God a speaking God and a jealous God, but he is a merciful God. Even as we imagine the worst case scenario, we're committing an idolatry, we find ourselves in the far country, we're serving, we've debased ourselves, we're debasing one another. It's a, it's a miserable situation that's being described here, and yet there is hope. Verse 29, but from there, you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. No matter how far you have gone from God and how deep into your idolatry and your spiritual adultery you have gone, if you turn and seek him with all your heart, you will find him. He will make himself available to you. He will be found by you, but there are no half measures. He says you must seek him with all your heart, which means leaving behind the idols and the lovers that you have turned to. I had a dear friend who uh, is a follower of Jesus, but he got caught up in idolatry. He slipped into it. It snuck up on him. But the form of his idolatry was a woman. He was married, children, and he gave his heart to someone who wasn't his wife. And he got to the place where he had decided that the most important thing in the world to him was this woman. He was willing to lose everything else in his life to have this woman. And so he told his wife and his children he was leaving them and he was going to go and and make a life with this other woman. He was willing to give up everything to have her. You see, there's only one person or thing in this life that we are called to be willing to lose everything for. It's God. He's the only one we should be willing to lose everything else to gain. Well, this man had put a woman in his place, and so he made shipwreck of his life. And in the midst of doing that, despite many of us counseling him and encouraging him not to do that, he went ahead. And I sent him this note, and I want to share it with you because there may be some of you who have done the exact same thing. Or you're in the process right now of being willing to lose everything 
for something else than Jesus Christ himself. And I want you to hear these words. I wrote to him, you've made a colossal mess here, but you don't have to go on making the mess worse. This failure does not have to be final. You can turn around. Don't keep going forward with this. I don't know if your marriage can be saved at this point, but one thing I know, you will never be better off going deeper into sin. That's true for all of us. What I'm saying, brothers, is that there's a way forward with Jesus. There is forgiveness with Jesus. There's redemption and the making of things new with Jesus. And that's true for every single one of you here today. No matter how far into the far country you may have found, moved, we are moving. The way forward is back. Back to the God who made you, to the Christ who died to save you and make you his own. That is the way forward through repentance. By God's grace, my friend did turn and he left behind his idol and he went back to his wife and to his children. And now they're in the process of rebuilding on God's mercy what idolatry had threatened to destroy. How could I say to a man like that, or even to you who may be far off from God today and, and running away from him as fast as you can in the wrong direction, that there's a way forward, that there's, that there's hope? The answer is because of what he says in verse 31. The Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. That's who he is. He is full of mercy. The New Testament says he is rich in mercy. And from that richness of his mercy, he has mercy on undeserving sinners like you and me. God is a consuming fire to rebels. But he is full of mercy toward the repentant. What does that mercy look like in practice? What does it mean tangibly? Let me share with you from the words of Gentle and Lowly, a book we have available if you'd like a copy of it. It's wonderful. But here's a description of God's mercy and what it means. That God is rich in mercy means that your regions of deepest shame and regret are not hotels through which divine mercy passes, but homes in which mercy abides. It means that the things about you that make you cringe most make him hug hardest. It means his mercy is not calculating and cautious like ours. It is unrestrained, flood-like, sweeping, and magnanimous. It means that our sins do not cause his love to take a hit. Rather, our sins cause his love to surge forward all the more. It means on that day when we stand before him, quietly, unhurriedly, we will weep with relief, shocked at how impoverished a view of his mercy-rich heart we had. He is a God full of mercy toward everyone who will repent. Brothers and sisters, we must not forget that we serve a God who speaks and who calls us to revere him by listening and doing what he says. We must not forget that we serve a jealous God who is not to be trifled with and not to be cheated on with other gods. And yet, when we go astray, as the word knows, and God knows we will, take heart and don't forget that we serve a merciful God who stands ready to receive you and welcome you and shower mercy on you like you've never seen and could not even imagine when you seek him with all your heart. Let's pray to that end. Lord, we thank you that you do not give us what our sins deserve and you don't treat us as our sins deserve, but you treat us as Jesus only deserved with love and delight and compassion. I pray for all of us who've gone astray and who realize we've let something else in our life become more important than you, that we've given our love and devotion to something other than you. Lord, convict us of that. And may we make our way back home this morning. May we come back to the God who stands not with a frowning countenance to shame us, but with a smile and a welcome greeting and a hug and a kiss to welcome us back home. May each one of us return again this morning and experience your mercy and grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.